Sorry to keep you waiting. And welcome back to the Unexpress Nintendo Podcast, the official Nintendo podcast of Goombastomp.com. We're on episode 222. I'm your host, Cameron Daxon. Joining us, as ever, we have games editor Mark Kalaroff. We're back and with no guest. No guest, just the three of us today. And of course, that third person is our indie games editor, Campbell Gill. I'm back and with no snow this time. Texas has unthought as thought oh, out and it's good. delightful. <laughs> I am so glad to hear it. I know you guys have had kind of a rough time of it. I'm I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just a bit, but you know, it, it's fine. Hell froze over, but now we're all good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you the, sent the I, snow to us. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, yeah. Mark Mark's been telling us how he's having to having to shovel the shovel the walk every every morning, every single week. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had to do that to get water for the house, so you know, oof. yeah, yeah. I listen. I I can't even tell you what it's been like out here. Um, because I don't California. want you guys to get mad at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, continuing with the the year of gigantic Nintendo anniversaries, uh, Zelda's thirty fifth, uh, Mario's thirty fifth was last year. Kind of they're wrapping up their their stuff this month. But today we wanted to start the show off by talking about a very special anniversary, 10 years of the Nintendo 3DS. Because last week, when we had that Nintendo Direct, there was a surprise, at least it was a surprise to me, the Miitopia port coming to Switch, which threw me for a loop. Didn't surprise Mark at all. Mark was like, yes, this is this is a correct thing to happen. Uh, for is. me, I was like, I don't understand what's going on. But we thought we'd take the time to celebrate the 3DS 10 years of a fantastic system, probably... If you, I mean, if you don't count the Switch because it's a, because it's a hybrid console, probably Nintendo's last great portable. Well, uh, it was their last portable. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but I'm saying like I think it, I think it'll probably be their last ever portable. Oh, you think so? I think so. I think they're going to stick to the Switch the Switch method uh, at this point. Whether that's continuing with a Switch Pro or like a Switch Two somewhere down the line, I really don't think mm-hmm. that uh, this is my stance, and I'm sticking to it. I don't think that Nintendo is going to be able to top the 3DS in terms of innovation. And, uh, you know, this just like the general, that system had an incredible run, uh, 10 years. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, uh, I feel like it's worth talking about that. I, yeah, I I don't think we're going to see another dedicated handheld unless Mm. it's something like a Game Boy Classic or something like that, if that ever even happens. But yeah, 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 I I, I think uh, another one's unlikely. I think it's going full Switch hybrid route from here on out i I totally agree with you i i wouldn't put it past nintendo's constant anachronisms to um put out a dedicated portable after the switch just for the sake of doing what doesn't seem to be common sense so (laughs) (laughs) well technically we do have the nintendo switch Lite. i was literally about to say there is the switch light but But come on you guys all know what we mean yeah Yeah. (laughs) yeah you guys all know what we mean so uh mark is currently in the in the in the midst of creating a fantastic uh, article for Goomba Stomp about the history and kind of the legacy of the 3DS, uh, so Mark, you want to kind of summarize that for us as we as we talk about the the 10 year anniversary of the system? I don't want to go too much into it since it's a really interesting read that I put together. No, I actually just finished it today. I'm just uh, we're waiting for it to be published, but you'll see how Nintendo didn't start innovating with 3D with the Virtual Boy. It actually started on the Famicom. And it's a long, long story, but it has to do with Luigi, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Satoru Iwata. So uh, you'll see when it's out. I love that. That's like the that's a an interesting trifecta right there. Um, so one of the one of the reasons that uh, I imagine Mark you wanted to write that article is because you have a very strong connection to the 3DS. Is that correct? Yes, it yeah. is probably. I wouldn't say it's my favorite Nintendo console. Because in all honesty, the GameCube will always be my favorite. It's just my, you know, my childhood go-to. Sure. But uh, yeah, the 3DS had some incredible, 
incredible games. It was where I got started with Kid Icarus, Fire Emblem, Metal Gear. I mean, Animal Crossing. It, it just had yeah. Uh, well, well, I guess I you guys. Well, you, got, you played yeah, that way on before game, that on yeah. GameCube, sure, sure. But sure, I did play New Leaf for like 500 hours. So there you go. You know, yeah. That's that's worth a call out. But yeah, there was just so much stuff on the 3DS. It was like Nintendo's first system since the GameCube, where the most amount of franchise were getting recognition. You had Kid Icarus, Star Fox, um, just so many franchises. I mean, Fire Emblem got its huge starting there. Yeah, it's well, just, you, and the great a RPGs, <laughs> a, a lot of stuff brought over. Oh yeah, almost yeah. almost every, almost every Zelda game. Uh, at least up until somewhat recently, um, all, all your all your handheld Zeldas are on that console. You got Majora's Mask 3D. You got Ocarina of Time 3D. Yeah, Link to the Past. Four Link Swords. to the Past was on the the new 3DS exactly. Triforce um, Heroes. Can't forget yeah, that pretty, one. It really was. <laughs> no, a, I'd a, prefer a, to forget that one actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Campbell, what about you? What's your history with the 3DS, if any? Yeah, I do have some history with the 3DS, and it's. Re- Pretty underwhelming compared to Mark's. Um, I got it um, in, I want to say, end of 2011 or so, whenever 3D Land came out. That's when I got it. That was 2012. That was 2012. Okay, thank you. That shows how committed I am to the 3DS's history. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that because I got it on Black Friday, the red 3DS bundle. mm, Mm. Nice. I just got the plain, simple black one, which I really liked. Um, I played the heck out of 3D Land, and then... I essentially let the system collect dust until Link Between Worlds came out because that's a reimagining of A Link to the Past, one of my favorite games of all time. And I played a lot of that. And then aside from a few handful of games here and there, I never really got into the system. It was around this time that I got more dedicated into home console gaming and the 3DS just didn't really enthrall me that much. I do sure. kind of regret that in retrospect because I see there were some great games that I didn't. I really didn't end up touching that much. Uh, Bravely Default, um, some of the Pokemon games, things of that sort. But yeah, my history of the 3DS is kind of limited. So I do. That's one of the reasons why I'm kind of appreciating the Switch ports of these 3DS games that are coming out. Mm-hmm. And I hope that a lot of the games I missed out on either get followed up or revitalized on Switch. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So you mentioned Bravely Default, um, fantastic uh, old school RPG. Uh, the sequel is coming out on Switch, I think, this week, right? Yeah, it is coming yeah. out soon, yeah. So yeah. I am really excited to see these 3DS uh, games get new life, either, like I mentioned, through a port or through a all-new game on Switch. And that's kind of something yeah. that we were, a lot of people were excited about when saying that Nintendo was going to dedicate itself to one console for the first time in a while with the Switch. That these right. ga- series that were once relegated to handhelds, like Pokemon, like these different RPGs, are coming to switch now so it's interesting to see how the ecosystem has changed so that people who are like me who didn't exactly like playing dedicated handheld games all that much but prefer consoles now can i get to experience that as well while still having that home console experience yeah yeah i it's interesting that you mentioned the uh the kind of the difference between wanting to play a handheld game versus wanting to play a console game because i i completely understand what you mean um when you're when I'm sitting at home and I'm like, all right, I want to play some video games, I very rarely reach for the Vita or the DS. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, why the would anyone I'll... reach for the Vita? <laughs> hey, all right, okay, okay, all that's right. a whole other matter. <laughs> aggressive, <laughs> aggressive. Uh, but yeah, so when I'm home, I'm like, yeah, I want to, I want to fire up my PS5 on my big old TV. I want to, I want to play the latest Mario game. I want to play Breath of the Wild on my full big screen. But the 3DS still occupies an interesting space because it's it really is it's the it's the hand it's the nintendo handheld that has as mark said probably the most representation of franchises and i think that's one that's honestly the reason i picked one up i picked one up very late in its life cycle probably only i don't know three years ago uh whenever the i picked up a 2d a 2ds the one that looked like a like a cake slice um, mm, beautiful. I grabbed one of those because I was like, oh, this thing's super cheap. I want to play A Link Between Worlds. I want to play Mario Kart. Yeah, I can I can, I can, can spare $80. But I, I ended up enjoying it so much that I picked up a new 2DS XL uh, because I was like, damn, I want, to, I want to be able to play stuff like Earthbound. I want to, I want to say some of those Super NES games 
in a handheld capacity. And I'm so glad I did. Even even though I I similar to Campbell, I didn't I didn't play all that much on my 3D. I mean, obviously I still have it. I still pick it up every now and then. But basically, I used it as a Mario 3D Land machine as well as a Link Between Worlds machine. I did play through all of Earthbound because how, how can you not? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But uh, and Shovel Knight as well. I used it for a lot for Shovel Knight because after. I met one of the Yacht Club guys at a retro game con some years ago, and I asked him, hey, you know, Shovel Knight, I, I don't have this yet. What should I play it on? And he recommended playing it handheld. So I was like, great, I will download that right away. And which has been, uh, you know, it's been a great, a, great, a great choice. But ultimately, I do regret not picking one up earlier. Uh, just based on what Mark was talking about just now, I do feel like I, we were talking today Missed about... A lot. I feel like I missed yeah. a lot, like genuinely. Like I've I've still never never dove into any of those Fire Emblem games. Um, there were so many uh, Shin Megami Tensei games that I was mm-hmm. like, ooh, I I yeah. wish I would have grabbed some of those when they were on, like back in the day. This because I I love that franchise and I somehow missed that there were a lot of them available on the 3DS. Um, a lot of Zelda so, yeah. games, Kirby, lot, yeah, Pokemon. Oh yeah, There's I did I did play, I did use it to play uh, uh, Ocarina of Time. 3D, and the Oracle games, Oracle of uh, Ages and Oracle of Seasons, just because I, I love those games on the Game Boy Color, and it's been a delight to be able to to pick them up on uh, on a handheld system once again. It really does feel like a like for me, it's a it's a, quite the throwback. I'm very much enjoying it. Um, yeah, the the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm like, oh wait, I guess I actually did play a lot <laughs> on this system. <laughs> well, it's funny, like I. No, like, I, I'm thinking the same too. I'm just yeah. thinking, I didn't even think about the virtual console and it was the first way I experienced um Kid Icarus's sequel, which you probably didn't even know existed on the Game Boy. Um I got to replay every single Game Boy Pokemon game, uh mm. Donkey Kong ninety five and just like there's so many Game Boy games now that I'm thinking about it. The three D classics were really cool, how they updated um Kid Icarus and Kirby and Urban Champion and all these other games. Those were really cool. I completely um, missed out on that. What what is that? So they had a line called 3D Classics, and it was literally NES games updated to 3D. Incredible! How did I? Wow, I can't believe I missed that. Yeah, but they weren't like they weren't literally like we went from 8 bit to 64 bit or like something like that. Like it was literally like they updated the bre- the the backgrounds, the frame rate. Like they just fixed up everything, and they made everything like more colorful and stuff. And then they just I put it on that. 3DS. I think that's great. Well, and hopefully, like, what? What? That's such a Nintendo move to like do this thing. Like, oh, let's take our classic games and put them on a new system and put a spin on them, and then not tell anyone about it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing about this. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, some other companies got in on on it um too. Sega did quite a few of them. Yeah, I was I'm pretty say, sure they, they did. did yeah, the Sonic the Hedgehog trilogy. I'm pretty sure they had all three um capcom did some stuff so did namco but yeah it was literally like when you put up the 3d slider it was that it was just everything popped out like the characters and stuff i think that's great i love that and well and i will say again i i played m- most of my experiences on the 2ds uh, or the new 2ds xl i should say so mm-hmm. the 3d part of the 3ds is kind of lost on me um such a even shame. on I, I guess so i don't know it, for, it didn't it didn't uh Again, based on my very limited experience with the 3D, uh, it didn't do a lot for me. It felt kind of uh, you had to like you had to, for me at least. I had to sit a certain way to kind of get the full effect, and mm-hmm. it just I couldn't it couldn't mm-hmm. quite connect with it. So for for me, the 2D yeah, that helped. was that yeah. was definitely the problem with the first model, where the yeah. 3D you literally had to sit from like an exact angle to get everything. But I right, feel so, like a lot of yeah. people didn't give it a chance because of that. And there were so many great titles, like Super Mario 3D Land. It was like the pinpoint precision with the 3D land, with the with the 3D on in 3D Land, was just incredible. And yeah. then Super Smash Brothers looked excellent with the 3D. Kid Icarus Uprising and Star Fox 64 with like all the projectiles coming at you and stuff. Yeah, I, like, I, there's I guess so many I, great ways that they used it. I, I what you said is is uh, worth mentioning because. Again, my experience messing around with the 3D was on that first model. So to me, it turned me off of like, ah, I don't even really want to deal with this. So they did update that in a, in a later model of the 3DS. Yes, the new, exactly. new Nintendo 3DS. The new Nintendo name. 3DS XL 
plus featuring <laughs> Knuckles. Um, and Dante from Devil May Cry. And uh, <laughs> um, So, yeah, so I never messed around with that, and I do regret it a little bit. Yeah, I'm in the exact same boat because I've always stuck with the original uh, model, which I realize is not the ideal way to play a lot of these games, especially the games that came out later in the console's life cycle. But it's just what I had. It's what I stuck with. And even in the original model, though, the 3D was used to some interesting effects. Like Marco Ray mentioned 3D Land. That game is absolutely ingenious in how it uses 3D to take sure. these platforms that would be completely invisible otherwise and actually make them visible when you turn up the 3D slider. So it was... It was a weird gimmick, especially looking at it in retrospect, because 3D was all the rage back then, but now it's not quite the buzzword that it once was. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting in retrospect. They used it to some interesting effects, but yeah, it's not the kind of the super exciting gimmick that just lights people on fire the way that, say, the um, the Switch, you know, hybrid console and handheld uh, right. well, that's, still that's has a, enduring that's... appeal. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and again, it's it's a total Nintendo thing to be yeah. like, hey, we, we, we invented this really weird feature, and we're going to use it for our first party developed games, and then drop it. Yeah. You know, it's like this came at such a time where Nintendo was doing those weird things. You had the 3DS, you had the Wii U with the delightfully clunky, unusable gamepad. You know, <laughs> um, Nintendo was making some strange decisions at this time. It was exciting. Yeah, it was weird and they wonderful, did. but um, it didn't exactly pay off for them all the time. Yeah. It yeah, didn't. but yeah. it didn't. But but the 3DS is what I think is gr to me the the success of the 3DS. I mean, again, the success of that system is undeniable. Mm -hmm. uh, a ten year lifespan, millions and millions of copies uh, of the of the handheld sell, uh, sold. People love this thing uh, all across the world. It's been an unmitigated success for Nintendo. Mm -hmm. What I think is great about it is that they did make different options for different people. Like I picked up a 2DS because it was inexpensive at the time, and I was just I just kind of wanted to dip my toe in. I liked it so much that I bought an entire other one. You know what I mean? I bought a new 2DS XL because I liked the 2DS so much. So it's like, first for a guy who doesn't really care about 3D, Nintendo was like, "Great, we got you covered," uh, which I think is very cool. Hopefully, they can continue to do more of that kind of stuff. You know? Wait a second, Cameron, you own mm. two 2DSs, correct? I I did sell my other one. And I yeah. own three 3DSs. Oh, because you have you have the beautiful <laughs> Majora's Mask Collector's Edition. Yes. I'm so jealous. I that was such a hard thing to get. I knew yeah. I the person at GameStop was so nice. Uh, they know they knew that I just like wanted this console, and they were like, "I can hold one for you," but that's even if we get any, because wow. they thought they were getting zero, and they ended yeah. up getting like four, and she held it for me. So. I was able to buy one, but before wow. that, I got the uh, the Dream Team Mario 3DS XL, which because I love the 3DS, but I just wanted a bigger screen for a lot of games, mm -hmm. so that was the main reason I got it. Yeah, well, and again, it, it just shows to it just shows that Nintendo is like listening to their fans for once. Of like, wow, you want a bigger screen? Great, we got this other version of the system for you. Oh, you want like the kid friendly one? You got a kid? You want to give him a cheap console? Great, give him the 2DS. I think it's Rarely have we seen Nintendo have so much flexibility with a console. Um, and I, I really hope that they're able to do that in the future. They're starting to do it a little bit with the Switch Lite versus the original Switch. I would love to see... I mean, we've talked about this many times on the podcast before. Mm -hmm. I would love to see, like, five different Switches at some point down the line. I was you know what I mean? say, give me that Switch Pro, man. Give me the <laughs> Switch, new Switch XL plus knuckles whatever you know featuring dante from devil may cry exactly, exactly. I mean, switch is already featuring dante from devil may cry we've got the <laughs> original trilogy on switch so it's it's ready to happen nintendo so yeah um it's a great system uh as far as ports i would love to see brought to the switch i don't know um part of me of course wants to see the uh talk about generations that you grew up with i would love to see the nintendo 64 ports that they brought to the 3DS, brought to the Switch. Um, I know that there are rumors uh, floating around about a new, some new Zelda, not new Zelda titles, but some old Zelda titles being ported over to the Switch. They, people are talking about Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, which would be great, but I would love to see the N64 Zeldas that they ported to the 3DS brought to the Switch. Whether that's 
the same exact like I would I would even take the same exact remaster that they did for the 3DS just bring it to Switch that would be fine with me um I just want to see Kid Icarus that's the Kid, only sure, game I want to yeah. see just Kid Icarus Uprising Sakurai's already said it would be like almost impossible to pour it over though yeah but yeah. he's he said a lot of things you know I, I, think, I think we've all I, said a lot of things in our life, yeah. Mark. So. I mean, yeah, that's the truth. To me, the more likely scenario, Mark, is that they will they will pull a Bravely Default and make a sequel to Kid Icarus at some point. I they don't actually, think it, they joke about it in, do they really? slight spoiler, in the credits of the game, uh, the villain is like, well, I'll see you in 25 years. Oof. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Which, it's been 10, so, uh, you know, we got we're 15 almost, we're more We're almost to halfway go. there. Almost yep. halfway there. Um, yeah, to me, to me, that seems to be the more likely scenario, uh, rather than have to like figure out how to do touch screen controls or or remap the entire control screen. I feel like they'll just kind of throw it all out and maybe start from scratch. Hopefully, you know. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of ways where they can definitely put it on the um, Switch. Even in like the game itself, they actually had a lot of different ways to play it that people didn't know about. Like if you go into the settings, you actually don't have to use the touchpad for the game. But a lot of people didn't know that. I mean, it wasn't as like precise to play with like face buttons as like the screen, but you know, there were options. Sure. Well, and again, it just shows that Nintendo occasionally they do listen and give players options. Um, so hopefully they can continue to do that as they uh, I know everybody's hoping for a couple more Wii U ports to the Switch, but it would be great to get some of those 3DS ports to the Switch mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's that's 10 years of the 3DS. Anything else we want to mention or shout out that uh, that we loved on that system? Animal Crossing, Fire of Emblem, Kirby yeah. Planet, Robobot, <laughs> yeah. Shovel Knight. Shit. I could just, you know, sit yeah. here and just keep even naming. Even just <laughs> reading, like... We could sit here for 20 minutes and just read a list of fantastic games and not even comment on them. Just be like, yep, that's on there. That's on there. Yeah. And there uh, was, I was so surprised that there are like some games that just somehow made it with ports. And the most surprising one to me was Metal Gear Solid 3D, which is Snake Eater, which is the third game in the series, hence the 3D in the title. But, um, uh-huh yeah (laughs) but uh i had never gotten to experience metal gear outside of some dabbling with the uh the twin snakes on gamecube so it was the first time i ever got to play a metal gear game and i was just so blown away after i played it that i bought the entire legacy collection uh metal gear 4 and metal gear rising revengeance in just like one bulk that's incredible. Yeah, and, and again, and it shows the the power of the 3DS of like the system reached so many millions of people, and the amount of stuff that was on the system there there was always something to play, uh, whether you're like a diehard Nintendo fan or somebody who's like ah I don't know like I I want weird indie games. Let me see what the eShop has to offer. Like there was so much weird um, yeah, pushmo box boy. You know what I mean? Exactly. So much um, stuff. I think it's incredible. And we, the game we about even... the rock falling. I, I don't even remember <laughs> what it's called. But and and we didn't yeah. even get into uh, Street Pass and like the yeah that... Street Pass Face Raiders the AR things that they put in so many great like I, I remember bringing my three, my uh, my 2DS to uh, PAX East a few years back and just keeping it in my pocket all day and then opening it up and seeing so many notifications about like oh you've you know you Street Pass. 20 30 40 people just throughout your day it's like it's incredible fantastic system great legacy keep an eye out for mark's uh surprisingly in-depth history of the system and its origins i I can't wait to read the whole nintendo 3d history it's not just 3ds it gets to the 3ds but it tells the whole just way there after talking about the influence of luigi on the development of the console which i don't think (laughs) I certainly was not expecting, but Luigi always shows up in the places you least expect him to. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of that's kind of his thing, right? Um, the year excellent. of Luigi. The year of Luigi. It never, honestly, it's never really ended. Um, yeah, always so Luigi. We're... He's always staring at you. <laughs> He's behind you right now. Um, anyway, so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk a little bit about uh, Capcom, a company that we all know and love, and uh, talk about some of their more recent games. So we'll be right back. Hang on tight. And... See you in a second.
So, Mark, you put a little time into the recent release of uh, Capcom Arcade Stadium, which is yes. uh, a, ver- a very interesting business model, which it is, is. Uh, it's, it's I think so it's, I different. Think it's fascinating. Yes. Well, why don't you why don't you walk us through it? So Capcom Arcade Stadium is like a digital arcade where you have to buy games to play them, but you get to buy them forever. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's cool. But it's all of Capcom's history, and it's like a whole bunch of stuff just crammed in there. And you can either buy individual games for $2, or they have $15 packs, and there's three of them, and they give you like a whole variety kit of stuff. And yeah, that's yeah. that's really all you have to know about it. But what they do is that, first of all, the the whole menu layout is so interesting. It's like this retro arcade where you can go from cabinet to cabinet which makes it really unique for just a menu. But then each game has like online play installed into them. So you can either do like high scores for like, I don't know, 1942 or section Z. If you want to see who has the highest score in the world or out of your friends, you can. And then they have like all these challenges where it's like, get this many points in this game or this many wins in street fighter. So they give you different challenges every day. So that way it mixes up what the games have to offer. But at its core, you're buying a way to play all your Capcom favorites in one location. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. There's, there's some cool features as well. Um, sh- yes. Should we talk about, should we talk about the, uh, the presentation? Like it's incredible. Yeah, so the presentation, the second you start up the game, you're in a 3D arcade. And it's like, you don't just pick a game on like a menu of titles. Like you literally, like you're going up to each individual cabinet and selecting yeah. them. And the cabinets have like what their attract mode would be in an arcade. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, hold on. I got to interrupt you. Have you, <laughs> have either of you been to an arcade Cameron, is that a question? That's a real. That's a real. <laughs> listen, that's a real. That's a real question. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Listen, arcades are not as common as they once were. I've been to for... arcades and pinball arcades. Okay, so for yeah. from for certain members of this podcast, <laughs> uh, I feel like it is worth mentioning that arcades were much more commonplace than they are these days. Are you talking um, to me, Cameron? I'm not. Listen, I, I ain't saying nothing. Look, um, if the three arcade cabinets at my dentist office count as an arcade, then yes, I have been to an arcade in the past. That is awesome. Or do you know if there are any Capcom games on those arcade cabinets? I don't actually know. At the time, I didn't really pay attention to the brands or anything. They were like really old school stuff. Like, uh, what's it called? Like the the rope swinging one um elevator those kinds of games Um, oh so it was probably like an atari cabinet atari yeah that's the one so you know very old school but when you're a kid going to get your teeth pulled or whatever it's very nice it it makes a difference well the the capcom i feel like the capcom style um this is very broad i know this is not this is not like I'm, i'm not like a capcom historian or anything like that but there's a lot of like top down uh shooters Yes, um, you know what I mean. Like it's yes. like like uh, it's, it's all beat 'em ups, fighters, and shooters. Exactly, um, beat 'em ups, fighters. Uh, you get your occasional kind of action platformer, like yeah. Ghosts and Goblins or Ghouls and Ghosts. Um, but it's a lot of like a lot of the top down, very difficult uh, shooters. Uh, great games in general, but mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm curious: were you able to play? Uh, I guess what did, what did you think of of like 1943? Like any of those old games? Like I, have you well, spent a lot I, of time with those? In yeah. So actually, at my house, we have a uh, arcade cabinet with hmm. some of these Ooh. games that are actually on them. 1942, awesome. 1943, and um, I think it's 1944. Yeah. <laughs> but we have we have a few of those um, on the arcade machine. So I had played quite a few of these but i've also so, played so some at the arcades yeah like street sure, fighter sure. 2 well, and, and of course street fighter 2 like yeah, it's, yeah that's kind of an arcade staple like it's yeah, absolutely yeah mm-hmm. commando and yeah a few others on here but uh some of them i knew of but had never touched so it's my first time with some of them but uh my here's my biggest problem with this game yeah please and i guess the biggest positive of the game my biggest problem with the game is its lack of variety and I don't mean that the games don't provide a lot, but the thing is we're dealing with the same three genres and then an occasional fourth. Yeah. 
well, which and, is kind of a lot of it's a lot of sequels as well yeah it's a lot of sequels too it's a lot like, you, then, like you can play yeah go ahead i was gonna say the positive thing about that is you don't have to buy everything in this collection and the variety packs the variety in them themselves if you were to buy one pack is great yeah well that, that's the that's the thing that's that's so interesting like i to, to bring it up again the uh the business model of this i don't even know what you call it uh because it's not cause it's not really a game it's, it's like Capcom free Arcade's, to start it's free it's it's very much yeah. a free to start game they give you two games Stadium, to start with yeah you gave you ghost battle of midway 19... yeah okay. battle of midway which is um 1943 1943 or it's i think it's 43 it's one of them 43 or 42 yeah, it's one, or, of or one of them yeah um and ghosts and goblins so those are free. And then if you want to, as Mark just said, it, basically they're arranged, I think they're arranged by, by year. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, I'm so pretty it's like, sure. They have a few ways to arrange them like yourself. You can go by favorites, like a favorite order. You can mm. go by genre. You can go by year. So they give you options. Yeah, which is like absolutely fascinating because like for anybody who's who's messed around with with like a giant bundle of games like this there's always stuff that you're like ah eh, i don't really care about this but it's included in the bundle so i guess i have it anyway this one it almost it's not exactly curated but it feels like it's going that way mm -hmm. you know like you can kind of you can sort of choose yeah, it's a pick How? and choose. It's a pick and choose, or or you could just buy the whole bundle for like yeah, forty bucks. Yeah, or you could just buy the whole thing. But... Which I I think you save like ten or fifteen dollars or something if you yes. buy the whole thing. The packs though are organized. I'm pretty sure of this. I may be wrong, but I'm positive that the packs are organized by year, and it's like every four years in each pack. So it starts right. from eighty four, and ends at like. 96 or something 95? no it might it might even go to like early 2000s wow yeah it's fascinating. it's because there, it's are, there a... are some in here that came out later like i think like 1944 came out way later yeah yeah it's interesting and, and like for for people who are into video game history i think this this collection does provide a valuable service and that you can really see the progression of certain types of games like the difference between you know street fighter 2 and then, like, like all all the later versions of that game, they, they're subtle differences, but you really do get to see, like, oh wow, they this is different, this is slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to play the original version of a game, and then the sequel that came out four or you know eight years later is, I think, very interesting, and you can kind of play them side by side if you want to. Um, so I don't know, it, it's a it's a fascinating idea, and I wonder if. You know what I mean? I wonder if they'll do. I wonder if Sega will do something similar, or uh, you know, other other companies uh, who were big in the arcade game back in the day. I I, I would be. I, I think I feel like that'll happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. the idea of Sega jumping into it is really exciting because they've done a great job in the past with collecting their Genesis games. In fact, one of the most played games on my Switch is uh, the Sega Genesis collection. Um, which actually sounds kind of similar to this collection in that it has the same kind of 3D home screen that simulates actually being in a space where you can pick up these games and play them, look at the cover, or put, pop them in your TV, you know, or in your mm -hmm. console, hook them up to the TV. Um, and Sega hasn't really shown quite as much love to its arcade games uh, yeah. the same way. So it'd be really interesting to see them take that philosophy that's well, it, made so many yeah. great genesis collections and actually do that to some of their other legacy content because it's more than just the genesis it's so true well and it's funny so um i don't know if i know this is a nintendo podcast so i won't get too deep into it but are you guys familiar with the the yakuza games yeah of course mm -hmm. yeah so you, you know that in, in most yakuza games you can go to a sega arcade <laughs> right and play, yeah. yeah and play yeah. you know there's usually like five or ten games available of like sega arcade classics from back in the day which is i think absolutely fascinating way to include that legacy content in a completely different game. Um, so it wouldn't shock me if Sega tried to do something similar, if, if provided the Capcom Arcade uh, collection Does takes well. off. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, exactly. I, I think the solution here is to just bring the Yakuza games to Switch. Oh, my God. <laughs> if they brought the Yakuza games... And listen, I already own a lot of Yakuza games. If they brought them to Switch, I would buy them all again. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Like being able to play them handheld. Ah, anyway, it's too too big of a dream. Um, but we wanted to we wanted to mention uh, we we talked about how the Capcom Arcade Collection has Ghosts and Goblins as a a free pack in, uh, and you can also purchase the sequel Ghouls and Ghosts um, if you purchase mm -hmm. one of the one of the packs 
Yes. Um, I believe it's in pack one or two. Yeah. But what just came out this week. Oh, boy. A uh, a sequel to Ghosts and Guys. I, I, I would call it a reboot. Yeah, that's exactly um, what it is. That's yeah. A, yeah, it is a it is a sequel slash reboot, or kind a of the resurrection, a resurrection, were. if you will, of the franchise with Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection, a the latest Capcom game to to come to the Switch. Campbell, what did you think about Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection? I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I am so conflicted on this game because it yeah. conflicts with me constantly. It's sure. a game that very much that makes it clear early on that it absolutely hates the player with a pathological oh God, yes. rage. Yeah. Um, I went into this having played both um, Ghosts and Goblins and Super Ghouls and Ghosts, not all the way through because I'm not a masochist, but I did play them a bit. I enjoyed them for their brutality and for what they were at the time. I was like, okay, these old school retro games are fun. I'm interested to see what a modern design philosophy would do for this formula. And I saw that they don't have a modern design philosophy for this. This is just <laughs> as brutal and miserable as the retro games. Is it? it is just about that. There are modern conveniences. But yeah. in terms of the endless onslaught of enemies, the constant brutality, the fact that there are so many deaths that feel like they're unfair that come oh, at yeah. you from out of nowhere where you're just oh, you're man. constantly like i was gripping my switch my palms were just break out in sweats i was my yeah. heart was racing it is a terrifying physically exhausting experience yeah but at the same time there's something good about it there's something fun about it in like this horrible masochistic way that once you've died dozens of times against all these monsters you know all these evil stage traps it constantly sets traps for you it constantly tries to come up with new ways to kill you which is impressive variety but um it's also very unpleasant to die dozens of times before get, like right before a checkpoint there were so many times i was an inch away from a checkpoint and a skeleton came out of nowhere yes. and knocked me out yeah absolutely so that's so how it is i want to i want to yeah. interrupt you for a second campbell uh, -huh. uh i i we recently published uh i, I wrote a, a, a short review for this game for for goomba stop uh i want to run some alternate titles by you uh, so the title on the website is Ghouls and, uh, Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection is a return to form for true arcade difficulty. Kind of a sanitized, you know, basic title. Mm -hmm. My original mm -hmm. title was Ghosts and Goblins doesn't give a shit about the player. <laughs> <laughs> and I was it's like, mm, that probably, probably won't. very true. Probably, but I was like, maybe that, maybe that won't get a lot Painfully of Painfully true, yes. Uh, my, other, my other option was Ghosts and Goblins, unfair, unforgiving, and unfun. <laughs> Oh wow! Uh, but I but after spending some more time with the game, that that was kind of like the first. I was like, oh, I'm so frustrated with this game. I, I gotta write this title. And then after putting a little more time into it, I was like, okay, it's not unfun, but it is un unforgiving. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so glad that I did not play this game, and <laughs> yeah. I don't mean that. I don't yeah. mean that to any disrespect to Capcom, but like these types of games get me like into a yeah. position where i'm like i need to like beat it if i'm getting closer and closer and closer yeah. and mm -hmm. yeah i i can't i couldn't go through it again when you guys said you were both requesting it i was like by all means yeah <laughs> like, i'm not, like, I'm not I, touching that thing it's uh it's funny it's one of those games where because like you know we, all three of us, we play a lot of video games. You know, we write for a video game website. We, we host this podcast. Like, I, I would consider myself, like, pretty good at video games, right? And this is one of those things. is a very humbling experience to oh, yeah. turn on this this game, this modern 2021-ass video game and just get your face kicked in over and over again. One of the fun things that this game does is every time you beat a stage, it tells you, like, your, your, uh, your death like how many deaths you took oh how nice <laughs> and it's it's it really does feel it's a little bit of like a like a stick of the knife in your ribs i remember beating stage two stage two out of i guess it's technically 10 stages right because you, you you beat the first five and then you run through it again um yeah right uh so i beat stage two on my first playthrough 179 deaths I mean, stage Jeez. two is absolute hell, though. Oh my I god! Mean, and, and especially listen, the boss. Oh my god! And this is oh my god, the Cerberus boss. And this is after bumping the difficulty down from. Uh, oh my god! 
Like, oh yeah. There, there's like, uh, there's like, I think there's four difficulty settings. Am I it's really like wrong about Super that? Meat Boy levels. It, it, oh, it's worse thing. than that because it's so brutal. It's unforgiving. Well, it, it's it, Meat okay, Boy so, is quicker too. So, um, Mark, it's interesting that you bring up Super Meat Boy. So, I, uh, I, I, I should have done this more in my review. I wanted to make some comparisons to that game. Super Meat Boy, obviously, a little bit of a different game because it is a pure platformer right yes it's a one where, it's so most of the time it's one screen where you just gotta exactly. get through you know one frame. Uh, but there's a there's a couple things that that game does so is your meat boy you can control your trajectory as you're jumping mm-hmm. which is a thing that a lot of platformers do a lot of modern platformers do I, I don't know if mario originated it but you can control how you're falling in that game right mm-hmm. ghosts and goblins you can't do that it's like if you it, it, it all if you jump it's like great you're jumping. This you is the direction that you you're going. You cannot control the trajectory. There were so many times I tried to be like, okay, let me jump over this ledge. And then I jump over the ledge and into the chasm right next to it. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Or like, or like, okay, I'm just going to jump up and avoid this, uh, you know, this basic attack. Nope. Can't do it. Like it's, I think for a lot of people will find it kind of shocking. Like, oh my God, like I, it almost feels dark Soulsian in the way that you're kind of locked to the animation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's uh, surprising, I think, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Um, I will. Can I admit something kind of embarrassing to you, Campbell? Yeah, sure. It wasn't until I made it to the stage two boss that I realized you could throw your attacks up. <laughs> which let me tell oh, okay, you, no, I had the. A, how- that's a game changer. <laughs> That boss is literally impossible if you can't throw up. Uh, that's I, why, that's I why had, I was like, I can't do this. I like. had that same realization <laughs> like towards the end of stage one, though, yeah. which made things significantly easier on me. But yeah. yeah. It, well, it, it's funny. If, if you go back, uh, one of the things when I was writing the review that I did was I went back to the to the Capcom arcade collection and I played the original just mm-hmm, to be like, because right. I would played the original in the past, but I was like, I, I kind of want to give myself a little reminder of what uh, what Ghosts and Goblins, the OG, is like. Um, so when you put them side by side, there is a lot of modern innovations in Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Uh, right. Being able to attack straight up, perhaps the best one. But the the quick checkpointing. Um, stuff oh, they have like, a checkpoint system. There is a checkpoint system. You, oh, you come across these. Uh, you come across these banners. Um, may, there's probably what three or four per stage. Would you say, Campbell? Yeah, I'd say around four per stage, and they're actually yeah. spaced pretty close together. But you, it does not feel like it. <laughs> it oh boy, it's funny. There, there is so this game also has uh has achievements. It has uh there's a I don't know we call them feats or whatever. Like there's a, there's a yeah. screen that's mm-hmm. like oh you've you know found a hidden chest or you know there's, there's different achievements you can unlock. Yeah, what same with Capcom achieve- Arcade. There you with go. Every single so game. Yeah. One of the achievements is beat a stage without dying, which is like, that seems easy. I hate myself if I would do that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to imagine the the level of acuity you would have to be able to achieve to get that achievement. Uh, I don't think Insanity. I could do it, to be honest. Yeah. There's only one man who could do it that we know. Uh, there's only one man listen there's one man who would drive himself insane for a year trying to do it uh shout outs to gerard i guess um yeah i can't imagine trying to to put yourself through hell for that yeah uh that said it's funny so this game was revealed uh i remember seeing a trailer for this game i can't remember it was during a direct i think yeah it was at the game awards that it was, was it at the game yeah, it yeah. was game totally awards. the game awards yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing a trailer for this game being like, this looks ugly as sin. Mm, right. But honestly, after playing it, I, I love the art style. I think it looks great because, yeah, if you're just looking at screenshots, it doesn't look amazing in uh, still form. But when you see it in motion, it's really interesting how it kind of looks like a medieval German storybook or something like yes, that. Yes, it and looks like the, a pop-up storybook. Yeah, and exactly. the animations, though, look like marionette puppets or something. Like, they're pulled yeah. by puppet strings, and it's this really interesting style. At the same yeah. time, it's also uniquely aggravating in some ways, which is perfect mm. for this kind of game. Like, looking at Arthur's stupid face is just... It is it his yeah. little his little uh, his little boxers with strawberries on them. It's with beautiful. strawberries on them, yeah, which uh, you will see very very often. So. Oh my god, yeah. So okay, so I feel like we we haven't really talked about like <laughs> what Ghost of Goblins Resurrections is to play. 
Uh, it is a 2D action platformer. Uh, you're you're trying to get from one side of the stage to the end of the stage. At the end of the stage is usually a boss. Mm-hmm. In the middle of that, so okay, so unlike your Mario's, your Sonics, your Super Meat Boys, where you know what the hazards are, you can kind of plan around them. Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection just spawns in enemies randomly, right? So yep. you can't plan around, okay, I know there's going to be this here. You can't... There are a couple points where, okay, yeah, okay, I know there's a there's a, a evil plant that pops up here, or I know if I cross this arbitrary point in the stage, ten zombies will spawn. A lot of enemies just appear out of thin air with seemingly no rhyme or reason. Yeah. Uh, you, you attack your enemies by throwing lances or other weapons that you find. You have unlimited ammo, so you can just kind of shoot weapons as often as you like. However, it's not Contra. You can't run and gun, right? It's not Mega Man. You literally have to stop, fire your weapons, move, jump, whatever. You can't do any of those things at the same time. It's wild. Uh, that's where I think where a lot of our <laughs> when we talk about being out, come from. frustration is yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a it is a deliberate sticking to the old school style, which in a lot of ways is successful because they do have some of these modern touches, but in a lot of other ways it feels like they're not making any concessions to the player. They're like, Nope, this is how we want to do it and you're either gonna get on board or get the hell out. Yeah, that's something that I could not stop thinking about as I was playing this game because Ghosts and Goblins raises this interesting question what is fair it challenges Mm. the definition of what fair is because by a modern standpoint something like say in a mario platformer or something like that a fair challenge is that you a mechanic is introduced you learn how to work with that mechanic then it gets more complex and then you finish the level ghosts and goblins meanwhile throws things at you randomly without any warning whatsoever without giving you so much as a second to understand what's happening to you you see these giant lizard mouths above you what's going to happen you run around wildly and you see that they're spinning skeletons at you oh my god what's happening oh my god now there's flying dragons you know so there's so much crazy stuff that happens and it feels unfair in the moment because you're not given time to prepare for it but at the same time It's playing by its own rules, and it doesn't want you to play with a 2021 mindset. It wants you to play with a 1980s, 1990s, hardcore, it wants your pennies, your quarters mindset. Yeah. And once you start playing it by its rules, though, that's when it actually starts to get a bit enjoyable. When you start to work with Arthur's extremely limited, often frustrating moveset, and you actually plan, okay, this is how far I can jump. This is where I have an opportunity to strike. This is where I can duck. This is where I can avoid this obstacle. That's when it becomes this almost ballet and this like strategy game of trying to understand what's going on. And once you do that, then it starts to become less frustrating and more like a challenge of technical skill that is supremely satisfying once you reach the end of it. Can, can I tell you, Campbell? So, so some years back, um, I well, I went to a retro game con here in LA, and I I went with with uh, with Gabe, a guest of the podcast, friend uh, of the show, books, uh, yes. Gabe of, of Boss Fight Books. Shout outs to Gabe. And so we were we were we were we had a table, we had a booth at the con, we were selling Boss Fight Books, and one of the things that I brought to kind of attract people to the table was a TV screen and my Super NES Classic. And we, we kind of just plugged it in, and people could like come and play Super NES games, and we could, you know, sell them books. And there was one guy who showed up, a, 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 just like some random some random dude who was at this con, who was like, oh, Super NES Classic, do you mind if I if I play some some Super Ghouls and Ghosts? And I was like, yeah, man, go for it. Like, we can kind of chat at the same time. And watching this guy basically speedrun Super Ghouls and Ghosts. <laughs> oh, wow. Is, and honestly, it is a, a jaw-dropping experience. To see someone play this kind of game very well it's exactly what you just said balletic like it's one of those things where it's like oh my god like he's dodging every attack he's finding the the golden armor he's it's it's truly incredible to see to see high level play of this game so part of me cannot wait to see what people come up with as Ghost of Goblins Resurrection uh, catches on and, and people and you know YouTubers start getting into it, like I cannot wait to see high level play of this game. 
Oh yeah, the speedrunning community is going to have a blast with this. Oh, yeah. And seeing how people who know what they're doing are going to experience it rather than hopeless reviewers who have nothing to work off of just trying to blitz it out before embargo, right? Yeah. Um, it's going to be really interesting Some, to sometimes see. After, sometimes after embargo in the, in the case of certain members of this podcast. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, myself. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's a brilliant review, by the way. Everybody go oh, check go it out. On. Absolutely. Go on. Public praise, man. Um, but yeah, it's a game that is truly a test of skill and yeah. it is an extraordinary kind of experience when you do get with it when you play by its rules you say i'm not going to scream at my switch i'm not going to throw it out the window i'm going to take the time to learn this and put up with dozens hundreds thousands of deaths seeing arthur in his underwear on a constant basis that sounds wrong um just doing that <laughs> when you do that there is some joy to be found in it it's yeah. an inherently niche kind of game there yes. are way more people who will be absolutely put off by it than people who will actually enjoy it but for those who do want this kind of thing it's it's going to be exactly what fans of the series have been waiting for i think i think so and it's, it's worth mentioning that uh this is the this is this game or rather this franchise has not seen a new game in something like a decade oh yeah, yeah. Like, there, there's been some there's yeah. been some mobile like some ios stuff but in terms of a true sequel slash reboot slash whatever you want to call it, it's been this really is long this time. is it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. And the cool um, thing about it is that how it blends a lot of elements from classic games before it. You know, familiar enemies, familiar levels. Like the first even, stage you've seen yeah. so many times. Yes, other, well, the first stage, the the opening cutscene, enemy movement patterns. Yep. Like they are truly the. It's like it's like going from classic Mega Man to Mega Man X in mm, terms right. of oh wow. It's the same animation. It's the same enemy. Like it's it's very cool to see yeah. some of the stuff they folded into Resurrection. But at the same time, it's there are so many new things about it too. It's something that I personally refer to it more as less than less of a reimagining and recreation, but more of like a repackaging of everything that you had in the series before it, and just kind of polishing it off, giving a new coat of paint with a new art style, throwing in plenty of new mechanics but keeping that same core foundation in there yeah. so it has a really nice union of old and new in it yeah it's uh it's so funny for for the amount of frustration that this game has like drilled into me over the last couple of days it, it really is i think something special and i, I hope it i hope it catches on I, I would love to see like hardcore players like play the hell out of this game Mm -hmm. um it's not necessarily for me like it's, it's a little a little i play games to relax you know what i mean um i fear for anybody who relaxes with this kind of game I yeah, mean, yeah yeah it, it's a fascinating kind of time but at, at the same time if i can plug one more thing about this game that i really appreciated that's new to the series is the co-op mode which yes. i played a fair bit of that and I was surprisingly enjoying my time with it a lot more because, okay, the way the co-op mode works in this game is that player one controls Arthur just as normal, but player two controls this floating ghost who can just float around the stage at will, nowhere is off limits, and just shoot at enemies at will, taking them out for the player one. So it makes the game significantly easier, and it's also this really fun level of cooperation. Um... I, it's, uh, I think we should we should mention it's local co-op only. That's true. Um, yeah. At least at least for now, who knows? Maybe maybe in the future they'll they'll yeah. develop some kind of an online thing. But as it stands, it's only on local co-op on the Switch. Yeah. But it is fun when you're playing it with somebody next to you on the couch. Or scre I'm screaming at the second player. You're like, take this guy out for me, please. I'm gonna die. You yeah. know. Um, it is really fun, and that's how I got through the second half of the game when you have to go through the shadow stages. Oh um, boy. Which is another new thing, actually. When you play through the game the second time, it keeps with series tradition where you have to play through the whole thing twice to get to the actual ending. Um, the second time around, you don't play through the same stages. Instead, they're remixed in these shadow forms, which include oh, new, cool. en yeah, new enemies, new uh, level obstacles, lots of new stuff. I mean, it's brutal, absolutely devilish the way they change these levels, especially because you go into them thinking, all right, I've done this before. This will be fine. And then all new enemies, all new um, stage hazards show up and it catches you completely off guard. But when you play it with somebody else to help out, it really um, but it takes a bite off of it quite a bit. So I really appreciate those two new additions to, this, uh, to the game. Campbell, how long is the game? Um, if you're playing it like 
to the first ending it's around five hours or so um you have five stages to get to the credits and each one of those really does take an hour because of how long how many times you die in it so five Mm -hmm. hours to get to the ending and probably i'd say a few more hours on top of that if you want to get to the the true ending so it's not it's not too long but not you know too short i I think it i think it depends on uh on your level of player skill yeah Yeah. player player skill and the level of difficulty because you Mm because you can adjust the difficulty as you go on and if you if you die enough times in a row the game does the thing of like hey um do you want to lower the difficulty? You know what I mean? It does that, like, would you, would you like to restart this checkpoint at a lower uh, difficulty level? And you know it's bad when it does that on the first stage of the game. So. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. yeah. It, it's hard. And, I, you know, I'm going to make a confession here. I'm a fake gamer. I did not play it on the default classic difficulty. I started out on the night level, which is the second most difficult version. Yes, me too. And then I dropped down to Squire when I realized I actually need to finish this game so I can write a review and I don't want to kill myself along the way. Therefore, I'm going to um, just give up a little bit and work on Squire difficulty. And even then, it was still harder than I'd say 80% of action platformers on the market, even in Squire mode. So it is a brutal game, brutal. <laughs> no matter what difficulty you play it on. Well, I guess the lowest difficulty page mode is actually pretty simple because it gives you unlimited uh, lives and you automatically revive wherever you die. So, But that really kind of defeats the whole purpose of playing the game anyway. You're going into Ghosts and Goblins for difficulty. So, <laughs> What, you, you weren't there for the story, Campbell? I love the story. Yeah, damsel in distress, man. <laughs> <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, <laughs> did they so, still yeah, keep? So, uh, just quick question. Uh, did they still keep the same opening where it's like the? Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. the it, same it comes down and steals her. The princess. It is. Mar- it is it's like a demon, like a, a red, a red, uh, a red devil kind of pops yeah. up and and takes the princess yeah, away. It's the same. It's literally devil. the same, like beat for beat. It is the same introduction which i thought was actually kind of neat it looks visually um, a little nicer because of the graphics and throwing some new flourishes on there it literally plays out on a scroll and it looks really like nice and painterly as they're yeah. doing it but yeah is arthur still sitting in his underpants in the cemetery that's exactly mm-hmm. it. and then he jumps into his armor yeah yep <laughs> it's uh it's the same intro it's pretty it's pretty pretty funny um so yeah so that's the that's the capcom update on the uh express podcast here so we've got Capcom Arcade Collection, great deal. Again, there's two free games on there right now, so it's like check them out if you like it. Maybe buy a buy a pack or two, or, or all three. I do, I do want to say that yeah, if ahead. they're going to add more games to this, X Men vs Street Fighter, please, <laughs> please oh, get man. it in there. That would yeah, be amazing. It's it, so that's the that's the thing is that Capcom, you know, obviously has published a bajillion fighting games throughout mm-hmm. their history. It would be really interesting to see some of those niche. Capcom versus SNK, you know, whatever. Yeah. Who knows? Or even Maybe. just, like, stuff like... I, I know there's Mega Man collections on Switch and stuff, but even stuff like Mega Man 2 or something. Just, like... Yeah. You know? Because it's wonder... cool It's cool not having to say that, oh, I bought the Street Fighter collection just for Street Fighter 2. It's cool to say, I downloaded this application, and Street Fighter 2 was $2, and I paid for it there, and that's where we can play Street Fighter 2. And yeah. it's online. That's the great part about it. Yeah, it's, so it's, I just hope they they keep expanding. I want I, them to. I I hope they do too. I, I think it's such an interesting business model. Um, it's like it it could lead to, to something really cool. So hopefully they they continue to do that. And then of course uh, you can check out my review of Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection over on Goomba Stomp. Uh, Campbell, you you wrote a review for uh, was it Nintendo Wire? No, it was for Nintendo Everything. Nintendo actually. Everything. I'm so sorry. I wasn't sure uh, if I was supposed to reveal that i write for other sites on the show but yes conflict of interest i, I can, write for we can cut it out yeah you know i write for a other heathenist snip, sites snip, snip. <laughs> that's so funny um meanwhile me at nintendo wire sh- shaking my fist at uh, nintendo everything that's so funny. <laughs> a <mortal laughs> rivalry. i think i don't know if brian likes you guys or not um <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh boy! Before before this turns into a <laughs> into a real brawl, uh, we're gonna take one more quick break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about. Uh, we're gonna give our in- indie spotlight for the week. Uh, Castle Kong. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back.
we're back. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into our indie spotlight for the week. So uh, Goomba Stomp is still hiring Nintendo writers. If you're passionate about Nintendo, if you're passionate about video games, and you you feel like you want to write for uh, for our website, uh, reach out to uh, the editor-in-chief, uh, Ricky D. You can check out our info over on GoombaStomp.com. The email um, is under the uh, the contact, kind of the about section of the website. Um, so we're still trying to, to fill some fill some niches uh, to for people who want to review games and, and talk about video games. Also, the N-Express podcast, uh, now we have a YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe to that. You can get all, our, all, uh, all the same content, but it's just going to be up on YouTube as well. So we can talk, uh, you can comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And last of all, uh, Rick, the uh, editor-in-chief of the website, is uploading some of our legacy episodes of the podcast, the best of the N-Express Reviews of games from years past with the original hosts, some great content on there. It's funny going back and listening to some of these older episodes and hearing, you know, what we were predicting back then versus what actually happened. So if you want to hear some of our older episodes, check out the best of the N Express over on the feed. Uh, so other than that, uh, both Mark and I have been playing a little indie game called Castle Kong. Mark, you want to talk about this? So Castle Kong is the latter half of the name taken Mm -hmm. to a literal extent. Uh, If you've played Donkey Kong, congratulations, you've played Castle Kong. (laughs) Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that we're not talking about Donkey Kong Country or the kind of the more modern Donkey Kong games. No, no, we were talking about the original arcade (laughs) Donkey Kong, uh, where uh, you are climbing ladders, you're jumping over barrels... Uh, you're hitting stuff with a hammer, except replace, you know, barrels in a hammer with little little gobs of hot oil and a pitchfork, and you've basically got the same exact thing. Obviously, instead of Mario, you're a different character. You're a little peasant boy uh, trying to climb these these little castles. Uh, Mark, what did, you, what did you think about this? Are you like a Donkey Kong fan, or is this like a, I actually your... really like Donkey Kong on the uh, arcade. Mm. It's actually like an arcade favorite of mine. It's another thing. So <laughs> going back to the arcade machine that we have in our house, um, it's not exactly like an official one. And you can tell once you boot it up, the outside is like completely Pac-Man. So when we got it, we thought it was going to be like all Namco. And then it turns out there's a bunch of Nintendo stuff on it too that probably oh, shouldn't funny. be there. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, uh, yeah. So th- they probably replaced the guts with uh, with a different chip or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Donkey Kong's on there, so I grew up with Donkey Kong. But uh, I had other means of playing it, too. And it was actually one of the first arcade games I actually ever touched at a local store. They used to have a line of arcade cabinets, and one of them was Donkey Kong. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoy Donkey Kong, and I don't, I don't see any problems with it. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's there's a reason Donkey Kong is, is sort of a, a classic arcade game. Yeah. It's, it's, always, it's, it's, very, always it's a difficult one. Oh, it's really hard. Yeah, um, yeah it, you're you're trying to rack up that high score. It, it's pretty unforgiving in terms of, mm-hmm. like, if you drop off a platform, you instantly lose a life. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I, I forgot about that when I was playing Castle Kong. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a mechanic in this game. You can't just like, so so much of this game is trying to avoid obstacles, and the only way to avoid them is to jump over them, or destroy them with a pitchfork. Mm-hmm. Um. So what I was, what I quickly learned not to do was like, oh, I could just drop down a platform and avoid this arrow or whatever. And like, nope, if you drop down even, even like the equivalent of one level, you know, you're dead, you're dead. One floor, you, you instantly lose a life uh, and you only have three to spare uh, between stages. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I, <laughs> I, I, I restarted that first, first couple stages many times because I kept getting game overs. Um because I was like, oh wait, how do I? What are the mechanics of this game? But uh, you, you you pick it up pretty fast after a round or two. There's nothing. It's really hard to talk about because it's it's literally Donkey Kong, and it's not a bad mm. game at all. It's it's no, a well made no. game, perfectly works. Haven't encountered any glitches or anything. Its no. uh, leaderboard system is very impressive. It oh, collaborates yeah. both um, Switch. MPC, and you can yes, tell with a little icon you. who got on what. Exactly, yeah. yes. So you can see the high score of every platform on there, which is awesome. So I had a question, actually, on the topic of the high scores, because when I was looking at the trailer, 
for this game. They weren't just showing off the gameplay. They also mentioned something about a cash prize that they were doing for the high scores. I did not understand it going from the trailer. Did either of you guys encounter no. that at all? Okay. Yeah, I actually, I actually won ten thousand dollars because <laughs> oh, I'm pro. No, that's, that's not true. Um, <laughs> Cameron's heading to the real Donkey Kong Island tomorrow. I, yeah, but, oh don't you God. mean the Castle Kong Island? <laughs> oh Lord, no. I was, uh, I was number six hundred uh, on the uh, the ranked list, which I think is as low as you can go um, nice. in terms of high scores. So yeah, I, I am I am not very good at these at this kind of game. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I was interested to see if there was going to be like a pro Castle Kong community or something starting There, there up. might be. I wonder. I, I, I don't know that this game has the legs to unseat Donkey Kong. Mm. Oh, absolutely not. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. the same it's a game. Great, it's a great alternative for like PC people who want to sure. play classic Donkey Kong, but obviously can't get to it through legal right. means <laughs> but uh <laughs> i mean it sounds like the only difference is having the pitchfork like is the pitchfork um an item that you can pick up or is it something that you always have with oh you? no no it's it's an item you pick up oh much, okay so then it's yeah. not different at all it, it's literally <laughs> it's it's not different at all okay yeah. well, great i want to i want to push back on that a little bit so in, in stage two for example uh, rather than climbing up the tower to oh to you're the, climbing down yeah you're climbing down oh. so which which that 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 honestly makes a difference that's um, revolutionary uh, yeah, there you go <laughs> completely completely flips the script uh, so ra- rather than trying to climb up a tower to to reach the princess and save them you are climbing down to uh, basically you're trying to untie a bunch of ropes that are attached to a chandelier so you can drop a chandelier on this little king. Uh, rather than try to to climb up a tower, so that was a, a little bit of the variation of gameplay. We went from animal abuse to murder. It's, it's straight up. You kill this man. You drop a chandelier <laughs> on this king, and he and he the little Phantom X's the are over style. his eyes. It's like yeah. yeah, it's very dramatic. So the question then is, what's the next natural progression from this nuclear warfare, or what is it going to do? <laughs> I can only imagine that this this uh, if you if you get far enough in the game it 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 progresses to nuclear warfare. I think that's that's Just probably all the, the ba- all the barrels are filled with toxic waste and um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is a it is a fun game. Um, it's again we we've talked basically this entire episode um, about about arcade games, and mm-hmm. it is very much that very much arcade style difficulty. So if it you is. aren't if yeah. you are not used to that, or if that's not you know if you don't like having to replay the same thing over and over and over again to master it, then like no, you're not gonna like this game. But if you are in the mood for a very old school aesthetic, you want to try to chase some high scores, then yeah, I, I think this would would scratch that itch. Yeah, that there's really that's all there is to say about it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with you. It's, uh, it's, it, I think it's made by one man, which if it is. Impressive props to him, yeah. I mean, or yeah. Her. Nice. yeah. yeah. The yeah, pixel props. art animation is very well done. I mean, yeah, and the music yeah. is soothing. You know, yeah, the music's good. good. Yeah, there's really nothing bad to say about it. It's just a, it's just a very simple high score game. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. Um. So yeah, if you if you're a fan of Donkey Kong and you for some reason or other don't have access to it or you I forget. Is Donkey Kong on Nintendo Switch on uh, yes. the, the NES yeah. online? Yeah. So there you go. So I, I would. I, I guess I haven't done this yet, but I, I should play them side by side just to see. You know, just to see what it's like. Um, but as far as I understand, it's it's pretty much the exact same mechanics uh, with, yes, with some is. very minor tweaks, such as going down versus up here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, still enjoyable. And you know, so maybe you know, let's say this: if you don't have an NES online subscription. Then uh, perhaps you would like Castle Kong, <laughs> but if you have it, then maybe just play the original. I don't know. The only the only problem is maybe grab it on a sale because the price is almost the equivalent to a Nintendo Switch Online month oh, membership. Oh yeah, sure. I, I imagine this will be one of those games that that goes on sale fairly. Often. Oh yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? If, I, if it's on like sale it. for like a buck or two, like. Yeah, go, go for it. it. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the simple advantage is: can you make ten thousand dollars by playing Donkey Kong? I don't think so. Therefore, <laughs> Castle Con is the best way to get rich quick with your Nintendo Switch. It it is truly the best way to get rich quick, uh, as we all know. <laughs> so yeah, I I think that'll about do it for us for for uh, an Express episode two twenty two. Anything else we want to kind of shout out or mention before we wrap things up? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better than better myself. Incredible. <laughs> I, I didn't it. even so say I, that clearly. Go it's check out the website. <laughs> oh, Lord in heaven. Check out the website. Uh, thank check you, Capcom, out the website. for bringing cool games. We're talking over each other. Let's go. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, shout-outs to Capcom for uh, for for giving us access to these these uh, arcade collection mm-hmm. and Ghosts and Goblins Re- Resurrection. A couple of great games. And uh, so, yeah, so I've been your host, Cameron Daxon. This has been Express episode 222. You can find me on Twitter over at, at Action Daxon. That's Daxon with an X. And you can find some of my writing on goombastomp.com, including my recent review of Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Mark, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, people can find me at the Markel, and that's Mark with a K. And, and I'm sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh my God. Who are we talking to? Incredible. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> No, we should keep that in. <laughs> Leave it. No, no. Go, just, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Just uh, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, you can find me at. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we were doing so well. We were doing so uh, well. Sorry, Mark. Go see. ahead. Go let's ahead. Go ahead. Mark see. with a Q. Get, get, shake go. it out. Shake it out. Okay, just uh, you can find my writing at kumbastomp.com. If you want to follow me on social media, it's at the Markel. <laughs> Listen, should, I, should I throw it to Campbell instead? I mean, I'm going to end up misspelling my thing, too. Oh, so. no. That's so funny. What happened? We did, that's it. We hit a wall. I just don't know. Oh, Wait. my Lord. I, you all right, man? I don't, all right. Uh, you can you can find me on social media at the Markel if you want to check out my writing. Uh, tomorrow, I'll have the 3DS article up and it has to go from famicom to 3ds if you want to see the whole history of how they got through all these liquid crystal displays and the virtual boy and all that other stuff check it out it's a it's a good time yeah i can't honestly can't wait to read that and of course that's uh at the markel mark with a c cow with a k K. exactly (laughs) and campbell what about you where can we find you on the internet well of course you can find me on twitter at as always at my pretentious uh twitter handle at campbell s gill and, of course, you can find my writing at GoombaStop.com. Check out um, an upcoming impressions piece I have of the indie roguelike... Uh, what the heck is this called? Voidigo. That's what it's called. My brain is fried mm-hmm. now. Uh, 54321. Okay. Check out my impressions piece of Voidigo, an upcoming indie roguelike that's hitting early access on PC in the near future. It's really cool. Check out my impressions of that. And of course, uh, because I don't only write for Goomba Stomp, I also contribute to heathenistic other sites on the web. So check out my review of Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection <laughs> on NintendoEverything.com. Or you can check it out on Goomba Stomp, you know, the preferred outlet. Uh, yeah, let's, let's be real. It's the preferred outlet. Uh, you only you get so Nintendo much. something on Goomba Stomp, where you get <laughs> everything where my review wow. is published. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Sega does what Nintendo don't. Um, that makes every no time, sense in this every context. time we mention Nintendo, and then we're gonna put a bleep if we mention the rivaling sites. Oh, that's so funny! Oh, yeah, wow. we should we should absolutely do that. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening. Leave us a review, like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that good stuff, and we'll catch you next time for more and Express Nintendo. Thank you so much.